Hi everyone and welcome to our first iMechE Talking Together event with Paul Stein, CTO at Rolls-Royce. This year we are creating a series of content in collaboration with the Royal Aeronautical Society and the Institute of Engineering and Technology around mental health and well-being. During the series we are focusing on the key themes around loneliness in the workplace and dealing with disappointment and uncertainty as a young professional. Today it's excellent that we have Philippa Kuganza, myself Joshua Thompson-Smith and we are both young professionals at Rolls-Royce and members of the iMechE Young Persons Committee developing this event. So a big thank you to Paul Stein who has joined us today for an interview around these themes and we have been sent some questions from our young professionals to ask Paul. So Paul, thank you uh, again for joining and we've got our first question which is what is your background and what does CTO of Rolls-Royce actually involve? So hello Joshua and hello Philippa. Um, so my background is actually quite varied. I joined Rolls-Royce uh, 10 years ago. Before then uh, I was an electronic engineer uh, involved in the uh, early development of mobile phone systems and the predecessors to mobile phone systems. Uh, so I had to sort of go on a complete technology shift, um, joining a company where um, turbo machinery and nuclear science became the watchwords rather than um, transistors and, uh, and, and, uh, and capacitors. Uh, but I've really enjoyed the journey. Um, as CTO of Rolls-Royce, uh, I'm really there to ensure that we're deploying our technology better than our competitors, so we get a competitive advantage through our technology, to make sure that we're fit for the future, which right now is a really important uh, part of my role, and to make sure that we've got the right people uh, and the right skills and the right talent pipeline um, to make sure that uh, in the future we have the right capabilities. Excellent. That's... Uh... That's, a, that's fantastic to hear about. And now Philippa's going to ask a few questions and I'll, I'll ask a few from our young members as well. Hi, Philippa. Hi, Paul. So um, how's your attitude towards mental health changed from when you were a young professional to now? Yeah, yeah it's a really good question. And I was thinking about this um, last night. You know, when I started my career, 1978, would you believe, um, words like, you know, depression and stress and breakdown were all just associated with failure and being a reject and nobody would talk about it. And people would sit, sit in the corner of labs clearly miserable about things and just wouldn't be prepared to say what was in their minds because that was associated with being a reject and being a failure. And I wouldn't say we're all the way on the journey to making mental health and mental well-being you know with the same standing as it were as physical health and physical well-being but i think we're getting close uh and these days you know we do talk to each other i mean even as an executive team if people are just stressed out about things we talk about it and oh boy that's been a very powerful journey and we've still got a way to go uh but the difference between now and 40 years ago is palpable all right so um thank you so how do you feel about making decisions such as having to stop the EFAN Next program and how do you deal with the disappointment? You know, it is um, part of the job um, that you feel passionate about what you do, you know, and if we weren't really kind of um, uh, engaged in our jobs and, and loving what we do and loving the company, we wouldn't be as good a company as we are. Um, and when you build up a capability, and that capability can be people or a thing like the EFANX program, um, having to switch it off is one of the toughest decisions. And you really have to be driven by the greater good of the company. I mean, all of us have doubts. Uh, I have doubts. Warren has doubts. Um, you know, we do go to bed at night and fold our arms and think, my goodness, are we doing the right thing here? But you've got to be driven by the fact that it's far better to make small, difficult decisions uh, than postpone things. And then suddenly it becomes a crisis. Uh, so I'm just driven by the greater good that's done by some of these difficult small decisions. And by the way, I don't think cancelling EFANIX is a small decision. But what I mean is compared with making sure our company is healthy and has a future, it's... Um, it's small. And just lastly, I should say that EFANX in particular, um, it's really important we see it as a success, not a failure. <clears throat> Actually, um, we've got a tremendous amount of learning out of EFANX. You know, the fact that we had to not take that program to a flight test phase 
um, some people are seeing as cancellation and see it in negative terms. You know, many of the team actually don't see it that way. They see that all the learning experiences that we, we gained from the 80% of the program that was massively successful, including the development of the world's most compact turbo generator ever, ever to be filled in on, a, on, on an aircraft. Um, you know, you, you've got to look on the positive sides as well um, and not just dwell on sort of headline statements. Excellent. I think that's, that's a really interesting point. And some of the other questions we had come in start to touch on that. And, and the next question sort of builds on this is saying, as CTO, are you uncertain about the future of engineering after the pandemic? And what gives you hope about fulfilling the technology that we did plan before the pandemic that may not now be possible? So, look, as, a, as an engineer um, and, and really sort of um, looking very broadly at the role of engineering, if there's one thing that the COVID crisis has taught us, um, it's about the fragility uh, of mankind, the frailty of the planet, um, and also to some degree a lesson for the UK, which is the UK needs a lot more self-contained capability uh, since our ability, for example, to ramp up ventilator production during the pandemic has exposed the fact that um, our movement to a service economy perhaps has gone a little bit too far. So I'm absolutely convinced uh, that post-COVID, uh, we are going to build back better as a nation and as a world. Um, I'm absolutely convinced that the green agenda is going to accelerate and many of the things we as a company and we as a country are investing in are playing exactly to that agenda. The engineers have to do that rebuilding. Uh, it's not going to happen by PowerPoints or by management consultants. Forgive me if there are management consultants um, uh, sort of watching this. Um, it's going to be done by us engineers, you know, changing the world, uh, creating all the new technologies uh, and um, fielding them in a way that's usable by mankind. Uh, I'm convinced the world is going to get flying again. Um, and, um, you know, because flying is good, it connects the planet, it connects families, it moves goods around the place, it shrinks our planet um, in a way that is just goodness for mankind. And that goodness is going to make its way back. But we'll be flying slightly greener aircraft, we'll be flying aircraft with sustainable aviation fuels, um, our power grid. Is going to have to be decarbonized at, uh, at an ever greater rate and that provides great opportunities for the UK uh, in many green energy technologies including nuclear uh, technology and it's just all um, jobs for us engineers to do. That's really yeah that's a good way of putting that across so the, the next one is a question we start to move away more to the as, as a young professional in the industry so you said you, you joined uh, a few years back now um, and we're going to do some sessions later in the series around this. So the question that mm. came in was, did you ever experience imposter syndrome as a young professional? And if so, uh, what is your outlook on this? And how do you think it can impact the confidence of a younger professional in the industry? So here's the secret. <laughs> Everybody gets imposter syndrome. Um, and the reason why we have imposter syndrome, particularly as engineers, um, is because we're driven by success. And unless we see um, success in a palpable form, uh, then we can easily become disillusioned. So view it this way, that if you've got imposter syndrome, it, it drives you to give your best, to work at 110% to try and sort of get people to be convinced uh, that you really have got a point, that you really have got a good design, that you have got a, uh, a new way of working or whatever it is you're, you're working on. Um, and always be um, a little bit unhappy with what you're doing in a positive way to make yourself drive further and faster. You know, um, I'll tell you a story slightly outside of engineering. It's about my sister. So my sister is a pharmacologist. Uh, she's hugely successful um, and she is always kind of questioning how it is she can, she can be that successful because I'm not that good, she says. Well, she clearly is very good. Otherwise, people wouldn't be the path to her door uh, for what she does. Um, but that sort of imposter syndrome is actually quite a positive energy. So, um, you know, don't lie to yourself and don't lie to others. But, you know, treat imposter syndrome as a source of internal energy. 
to inspire you to do even better than you you would otherwise do. That's, uh, that's excellent. Yeah, that's cheers, Paul. Thank you for that. That's good perspective on that. Um, so it can obviously can be tough and isolating sometimes being an employee mm -hmm. from the Black, Asian, and minority ethnic group community. Yeah. So what do you think about how this can challenge young professionals in the industry? So look, it's our duty um, to create a world. It's our duty as citizens of the planet uh, to create a world that is comfortable for everybody, everybody on the planet, but particularly engineering. You know, engineering is a team sport. You know, engineering has to embrace everybody. Engineering works best when it's all thinking styles from all cultures, all genders, and all sort of uh, ways that human beings approach, approach a problem. And so, um, you know, we, 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 we've got to see uh, people um, feeling isolated as a failure of us as engineers to get the best out of everybody. And I think that's the way we've got to view it. You know, I, I have to experience so many times in my life to the point where I don't need to see data, I just know it to be true that some of the most creative and brilliant teams I've ever worked with are teams that have come at the problem from a number of different directions, brought about from a number of different thinking styles, ca caused by people thinking in different ways, coming at the problem in different ways, and where everybody feels comfortable to contribute, where quiet people feel comfortable to speak up, um, because sometimes it's the quiet people that are sort of beavering away in the background and thinking first before speaking later or the other way around with some people, um, you know, and where all different cultures and ages and genders um, are, are just feeling equal. And that is our duty to create that world. Are we there yet? I don't think so. I think we've still got a little way to go. Um, as engineers, I like to think you know, that engineering has got a sort of, uh, um, that engineers are, 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 are friendly, understanding people, you know, who, who see the world in an egalitarian way. I'd love to think that way. And I'm just hoping engineering can sort of lead the charge uh, and be a, a, just a far more welcoming uh, environment uh, for everyone. Um, and if we can somehow sort of see ourselves as engineering championing uh, diversity and inclusion, that would be brilliant. <laughs> Yeah, true. Make a good point there. Um, so many young people today have real concerns about the impact of climate change on the planet. So how can engineers make a positive difference? Gosh, well, engineers are the answer. If for engineers and farmers <laughs> between us, I've got to sort this out. You know, everyone else is just passing information around between themselves, you know. The, the, the way we do farming um, and our whole sort of um, attitude towards agri agriculture and husbanding the land is one dimension. Perhaps that's for agriculture engineers, but perhaps not for the majority of people that are on this line. Um, but it's engineers that are going to do something about climate change. You know, fundamentally, um, people's behavior will shift a little bit you know, with persuading people to use less energy or, I don't know, whatever it is, um, hopefully not fly less because hopefully we'll be using sustainable fuels by then. You know, but fundamentally, we have to take the view that it's really hard to shift human behavior. So we have to change the environment in which people um, uh, behave um, to decarbonize it. And that's why engineering is absolutely vital. So in the Rolls-Royce domains, decarbonizing aviation, absolutely critical you know decarbonizing aviation we've got a plan we've got a plan which is you know to make more and more efficient um, engines and airframes we've got a plan to ramp up the availability of sustainable aviation fuels that have a net zero carbon effect uh, on the environment we've got a plan to introduce electrification and some other technologies for smaller aircraft so that we can get that two percent of global co2 which is um, contributed by aviation down and down and down to something like net zero by 2050. And then in other parts of the environment, the grid, uh, quite sort of um, famously, Rolls-Royce has been lending its efforts to the design of a small modular reactor, along with a consortium of UK engineering companies. Um, brilliant piece of engineering work, I can say that because I wasn't part of the team that actually formulated the idea, uh, to drive down 
the available cost of zero carbon electricity. So we're not asking people, the consumers, to change their behavior because we're not going to increase the cost of electricity when you plug it in the wall. It's just that rather than it being derived from burning coal or setting fire to other forms of fossil fuel, now we can derive it from nuclear power to accompany other forms of, um, of, of uh, intermittent renewables. So it's engineers that are going to change all this. It's engineers that are going to do it. You know, all the rest is PowerPoints and bits of paper and, and detail. It's, it, it's us. Yeah, it's definitely a good way to look at things. Obviously, this is achievable if we just all do a bit. Yeah, um, so, absolutely. I agree with you. So my next question is, do you think STEM careers can be lonely? And have you ever felt loneliness in the workplace, especially as a young professional? Yeah, it, it, that's a, a very interesting um it, 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 it's a very interesting question. And it, it really comes back to something I said earlier when we talked about um, uh, diversity and, um, and, and, and other, other sort of uh, uh, dimensions to inclusion. You know, it, I, I keep using this phrase, and my old, um, my old boss, Colin Smith, um, used to keep saying it, and I absolutely believe it. Engineering is a team sport. It's a team sport. You know, unless you're developing something incredibly small, you're doing it with other people. You know, you know, someone's going to worry about the design. Someone's going to worry about, you know, I don't know, the software. Some, someone's going to worry about the hardware. Someone's going to worry about the mechanical design. A whole team has to work together in unison. Um, and then if you're doing the project really well, uh, you're getting a team multiplier caused by the thing you're developing, not just being the sum of the parts, but greater than the sum of the parts because you're getting the team to help the team. So if you're feeling lonely, and feeling excluded, then something is wrong. That's not the state of being that should be in engineering. It should be that everyone feels that they're contributing. You know, I, I don't want to kind of blame leadership too much, but it is a sign if someone is feeling lonely as they start their career, perhaps they're feeling a little bit, you know, my God, how can I contribute to this? I'm one person in a 1500 team developing a new engine. I don't quite know what I'm doing. I'm feeling uncertain. You know, it's not down to the newcomer and the new starter to take full responsibility for feeling lonely. It is their responsibility perhaps to speak up and say, how can I help? You know, what do you want me to do? What does good look like, boss? You know, how can I sort of, how can I engage more broadly in the team? You know, so, um, you know, something is wrong uh, if you feel lonely. So put your hand up and just say, how can I help? Yeah, yeah that's, uh, a good starting point. that's good. I think as young professionals, we, we've all felt that at some point is you put in a team and it's, oh, what do I do now? Or how do I progress this? This So yeah, it's a really mm. good way of looking at it. So now mm. the, the question moves towards, obviously, a CTO, you're, you're, you'll be aware of the media coverage that happens of Rolls Royce mm. and in the engineering industry. So do you find that media coverage and the uncertainty of it in the industry a problem? And how, how do you deal with it? Yeah, um, again, it's, it's a very good question. Um, so first of all, uh, uh, I'll start with a, a moment of admission. Uh, and it's this, you know, um, that many of us that do a lot of media work, um, it's not always the case uh, that what you say or what the truth is what appears in the media. I'm sorry to break that to uh, the young engineers today, um, but um, it's often the case uh, that when you know some detail behind what's being said, um, you know, sometimes there are some quite unkind things published about our company, uh, which don't really provide a balanced agenda. But on COVID-19, I actually think the media has done a reasonable job of portraying the seriousness of the situation and the impact on our industry. So I think it is a time when the media is helping uh, and where the media is really conveying the degree of seriousness and the um, the kind of call to arms to mankind uh, to um, do something about this. Um, so, you know, do, do, do I feel it unsettling? I don't feel it unsettling. Uh, you know, to me, I just think the media coverage is portraying the reality. Instead, I think I, I, I take it as a sort of, um, uh, first of all, you know, obviously a, a disappointment. We've all gone through the phases with COVID, a sort of denial it can't be that serious. 
um, and then a sort of anger, somebody must have done something wrong, um, and then a disappointment, and now we're, now we're definitely in the phase that we've got to do something about this. Um, and industry is having to work across functions. Um, so, um, uh, you know, our, our um, uh, part of the company connected with civil aerospace, we're not going to get flying again because of something that we do. We're going to get flying again by cooperating with the medical authorities, with politicians, when things like air bridges start to get reestablished when the medical profession comes up with the right testing or immunization or whatever medical um, kind of uh, interventions are going to be required uh, to connect the planet again. Um, and we've been putting our hands up and saying, how can we help? And we have been helping. So as a company, we've been very proud to have teamed up with other companies uh, like GKN and Smith's Medical, uh, repurposing um, some of our capabilities that we've had to sort of um, uh, um, you know, put on furlough just to suspend while the aviation industry is is taking a pause, uh, and we're making ventilators. Uh, so we're quite um, proud to be part of the ventilator challenge. We're now producing quite a large number of those ventilators to the uh, Smiths Medical Design. The whole industry is pulled together. Everyone sharing uh, across the whole uh, the whole industry, um, and uh, you know, we're now in a position where I hope you know, shortage of ventilators amongst all the many things we do have to do is at least, you know, that that risk is being mitigated by our actions. So, um, you know, it's unsettling for us all and it's unsettling for us all in engineering. But as I said before, you know, as we build back better, as we recreate um, uh, our country, as we reindustrialize, as we drive harder towards net zero carbon, the role of engineering uh, is going to get stronger and stronger. Excellent. And I say the as young professionals, it is sometimes you know, it's a proud moment to see Rolls Royce is so involved with ventilator challenge and making PPE yeah. through three D printers. So that that side of the media is uh, is it was really good yeah. to see. The yeah. one part of the um, the topic around this current situation as well that especially a lot of young professionals are being impacted by is furlough. Mm. And uh, the question we had in was that a number of people are on furlough during a very difficult time for the company. What is your advice for them? Yeah, well, I mean, firstly, um, you're not forgotten about and, uh, you know, please um, sort of, uh, um, you know, I'm very sorry for, for those on furlough, but you're absolutely not forgotten about. Um, I think we have to view things in a number of ways. I mean, first of all, to um, contextualise, uh, certainly for those that are furloughed from Rolls-Royce, you know, you're helping save the company. You're helping save the company because if you weren't on furlough, um, and we tried to just keep the company running at the size it was when engine flying hours at one point had collapsed more than 80%, um, you know, and, and engine flying hours are the financial fuel for our, our biggest business, um, then the company wouldn't have survived. So you're helping the company survive, and thank you very much. And I know it, it, it's a little bit sort of challenging uh, from 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 uh, from many perspectives, but first of all, try and sort of um, uh, um, you know sort of be be guided by that. Secondly, um, it's not personal. You know, uh, we we didn't sort of point at individuals and say, "Oh, you're no good. You're being furloughed." It's nothing like that at all. You know, it just happened to be that those projects that people were working on, or those capabilities or facilities that those people were working on at the time all this happened. Um, dictated who it was uh, got moved into the furlough scheme so it's not um it's not personal um and um it's temporary you know it's going to be um you know this time will pass you know it, it is there a guaranteed future for everybody well you know the, the world is is just not a certain place anymore but we are going to go through you know as as a as a country as an economy we will go, get through this it will pass there is a bright future for engineering there is a bright future for for rolls royce but there's one last piece of advice i've um, i've got for people on furlough um and um and it and it's this really you know it's to use the time to invest in yourself train yourself you know the world is a really exciting complicated place from a technological perspective and sometimes um, and I'm sure we all do this but in furlough it's just a great time to accelerate it 
um, you know, certainly in technology, teach yourself what the Internet of Things is all about. You know, um, many of um, uh, the um, uh, uh, colleagues and, 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 and engineers sort of listening to this maybe are in the mechanical engineering space. I wonder how many of them know about fifth generation cellular. Uh, and the impact of the Internet of Things on mechanical systems. It's going to be huge. Do you know about it? You know, if you do, great, go on to another subject. If you don't, go Google it and go form your own opinion about whether the next mechanical product that you design actually could be a different design if we had capability that comes from fifth, fifth generation cellular and on IoT devices. And I just picked that as an example. Of course, you know, there's, there's new... Um, uh, material systems you could read up about um there's there's a world of digital that i can't even start to list here that uh, um i'm sure uh, many people listening know much, far more about that than me and 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 so educate yourself and become a broader engineer they say the best kind of engineer is what's called a t-shaped engineer <laughs> so a t-shaped engineer doesn't mean someone who drinks a lot of tea uh it means uh that um they have a, a one or more world-class depths in what they do um so you know you know a shed load about a particular topic or a number of particular topics where you could be considered national class or even world class and then the t across the top means and you know something about a large range of subjects so that if a new problem comes up you're not just relying on your skills in those individual little stovepipe areas where you're world class instead you can tap into a breadth of knowledge that you've got uh, about all sorts of technological solutions to a problem. Um, one thing I would advise mechanical engineers to learn more about, while well, if you're on furlough, is learn about the world of electronics and electrical machines. Because if there's one thing I've found uh, that is um, a gap uh, amongst some mechanical engineers, uh, and I hope not everyone listening, um, it's um, that you know, do you know enough? about how the world of electrical machines that is driven by huge investment in the electric vehicle industry and other forms of electrification is impacting us in the world of mechanical engineering. Because it is, it's huge. You know, actuating things now are done electrically rather than hydraulically or by other methods and, and, and. So that's another topic area that um, we can learn about while on furlough. That's good, yeah. And as I say, all the digital coding classes you can do as well. I've been doing a few. Um, yeah. What, what, uh, Great stuff. In this period. Go, so, buy, yeah, go buy a Raspberry Pi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Um, so just going back, um, earlier when I asked about in the workplace, you did point out that leadership is one of the things that has an impact on whether employees feel lonely in the workplace. So that brings me on to my next question. As a senior leader, how can you positively influence the mental health of those within the organization? Yeah, that's a um, that's 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 a good question, and um, and I I would say I've got kind of three rules of 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 being a good leader, which um, apply to uh, sort of um, treating individuals in the right way and giving people a sense of direction and being part of a good team and helping their, their mental well-being. The first is you're there to provide a vision. You're there to provide what's often called an, a North Star. You know, if you're a very senior leader and as a CTO, you know, I, I set quite big uh, directions for the company like you know um, we're driving towards net zero carbon or we need to get into sustainable aviation fuels or whatever the the particular uh, particular thing is um, as you get into um, uh, more junior levels of engineering management you know your vision might be uh, one to do with completing a task a little bit more quickly than people would otherwise expect or, or whatever, whatever whatever it is so set a vision for your team that gives the team a sense of purpose and gives individuals a feeling of how they can contribute to the team that's number one uh, number two you know in a company like rolls royce this is particularly true of a digital startup it's slightly less true but but you know it's always true it's 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 not bad sometimes to look back over your shoulder and be proud of your history you know, some people are a bit ashamed of their history. You shouldn't be because your trajectory into the future and your culture is part of where you've come from. 
both personally and 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 as a company. You know, in Rolls Royce, we have a massive and proud history, of course, dating back to um, um, sort of before the First World War. Um, and so, you know, we've got a rich sort of history, and we can say to people, "Come on, you know, we're we're running this company, taking over from from Lord Hives and from all the various." Uh, uh, great names that um, ran this business um, in the past. Um, and again, I think that gives people a sense of belonging um, and a sense of grounding. It's like a handrail. Um, so, you know, it makes people sort of, um, you know, ha ha have a sense of, uh, of purpose, I believe, looking back over your shoulder as well, and, uh, as well as looking into the future. And the third one, is that yes engineering is a team sport but a team is made up of individuals you know and, and much in the way that a, a football manager will talk to each of the players in turn giving them individual advice and if the football manager never ever spoke to the goalkeeper individually you wouldn't expect a particularly good result of the uh, on the match well engineering is exactly the same you know if you've got a large team working for you it's really important that you take the time and effort to engage with people as individuals listen to their individual needs how's it going a quick phone call to say hey well done i you know you you, you i saw you managed to sort of complete that thing and 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 people say it was like really difficult and well done or you know somebody gave a great newspaper interview you know whatever that whatever they've done it's really important to deal with people as individuals and almost have like a checklist in your mind um you know go through the people that work for you and think, oh, have I spoken to that person in the last week? Because if you haven't, you ought to give them a call and see how you're getting on. You know, Bill Gates used to say uh, that 30% of his time was spent on people issues. Um, and I have to say, when I read that years ago, I thought, oh, come on, you know, he must be sort of, um, you know, whining and dining and uh, working out how to spend his money. Actually, that's not true. He, he, is a, he was actually a great leader. You know, he grew that company uh, to the size it was, not by default, but by spending a hell of a lot of time on people issues, dealing with people and um, treating people as individuals. And I think, you know, leaders like Bill Gates are people who are the modern day version uh, of some of the forebears of, of, of Rolls Royce and the other great companies that uh, I'm sure young professionals work for. Yes. Um, so this brings me to my final question bit less serious. So what's your favorite hobby to wind down and step away from the professional environment? Oh gosh, Philippa, right, okay. Um, so um, I've actually got uh, a number of different hobbies, rather boringly, um, and depending on um, what mood I'm in, I'll choose, I'll choose the hobby. So um, if it, if I need to kind of feel a bit fitter and de-stress and that sort of thing, it's cycling. I am not a hugely fit person. I'm not someone that does sort of 60 miles uh, a day. And I live in a very hilly part of the country uh, in Derbyshire um, where um, it's very easy to run out of puff very quickly. But, you know, one of the wind down things for me. Oh, and it's by the way, it's technology that's come to the rescue because I've got an e-bike now. Um, and for those that haven't got an e-bike, it doesn't mean that the electricity does all the pedaling for you. It simply assists your pedaling. And it means if you're not so fit like me, your range can be hugely increased. But, but it's still you still run out of puff brilliant invention it's the best thing i bought in ages so well done if there's any e-bike uh, engineers on the um on, on the call secondly uh, i play a bit of guitar once again badly uh, never in the um, company of other people um but i do find music um particularly if i'm playing it is just a great way to sort of you know reprogram your head get another sense of rhythm in your head when your head is full of chaotic thoughts uh, from dealing with a lot of difficult um, pressured issues during the day. Music has a wonderful role uh, for us all, and some people just enjoy listening, and some people enjoy playing, and you know. So that's the sort of number two. And the third one, um, yes, I am a Raspberry Pi programmer, um, so I've become a bit of a, a geek. Um, this house that I'm talking to you from, the whole house is kind of wired for sound with Raspberry Pis controlling the boiler and cameras and various other things, uh, and I just find it fun. And it kind of teaches you, you know, you, you, you go to a lot of lectures about Internet of Things and that sort of thing. And, and some of them you realize that people are talking rubbish because you've actually done this stuff yourself. 
you know what you can and can't do. So it's not just a form of relaxation. It's also a way to sort of keep sharp um, about the world of technology. Thanks, Paul. I think as young professionals, it's important that I know some people that I'm friends with um, don't give themselves time to do the hobbies because they think it's work, 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 work. I'm a young professional. I need to, to you know, show every hour of the day what I can do. Uh, but I use the classics like golf, football, um, watching Arsenal isn't uh, something that relaxes me. But yeah, so yeah, those are my things. And Philippa, what, what do you do? You do different things as well? Both are quite similar. Um, badminton, music, really. Yeah. Watch yeah. a bit of Netflix. Anything to get my mind off of it, really. That's it. That's a perfect combination. And yeah. It's really important to, I think, as young professionals to recognise that will help yeah. you um, progress. So excellent. Well, thank you to everyone who has sent in questions for this interview today. I think it was really fantastic, Paul, to get your insight, um, especially as someone very senior in the industry. People really do look up to, to uh, executives like yourself for guidance and uh, what our careers may look like in the future as well. So it's been excellent talking with you and we really appreciate your time. Uh, and you've, you've taken part in our first Talking Together event. So uh, thank you for that. And if anyone has enjoyed this interview and really wants to look for further events, please do look out on the iMechie website and app. Uh, the Talking Together series will continue and we'll be opening up these conversations around loneliness in the workplace, dealing with uncertainty and those disappointments you may feel as a young professional. So thank you again from the societies and the institutes supporting this event and from the IMEC uh, and take care. So thank you. <laughs>